All right, after that song, I probably should switch my message and preach on missions. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 just to begin with. We're going to hit one verse. I've been hoping all week, I've been like with bated breath watching these guys preach, thinking, I hope no one steals the theme. I mean, the whole theme is, you know, limitless. So I was, I'm real original. I said, oh, I'll just preach on limitless, you know, that type of thing. So my, my, the title of my sermon is Limited Yet Unlimited. Hasn't the preaching been good? I mean, Monday night was like the oratory of oratories, and then the, you know, what an application about the, you know, do you want a Moses or do you want an Aaron? I was like, wow, that's good. That whole sermon was good, and then, um, of course, Brother Burke gets up, and he doesn't even have to try. He just, uh, he's funny, he's serious, you know, God's word goes forth, he relates to everybody. And then last night he preaches on being insecure, and I'm like, you know, I think I'm feeling more insecure about this message, you know? <laughs> I mean, he gets up and says, yeah, you know, I was having my devotions, I just came up with this message, uh, threw it together, and then, you know, the aisles are flooded. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you touch that, you know? And so, you know, so I'm like, these are two tough acts to follow, and then it hit me. I don't have to be insecure. I don't have to be intimidated because I can do something that they both did. I can preach an hour. You know, <laughs> I can do this, right? In fact, what does that say down there? <laughs> don't put that on the pulpit. When I walked in Sunday morning, I was like, this is great. You know, all the people who want to say, you just preach too long, you preach too long. It's like, right there, buddy. It is limitless. So, anyway, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 7. I'll, I'll read it, and then we'll get to it in a moment, and then we'll be all over the place. There'll be some places I'll ask you to turn to, and other places you'll just have to listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Just hold on to that because we're going to get back to that in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Lord, how exciting it is to open your word and get real solutions to real problems. And Lord, there's a lot of confusion in this world. There are people sitting in here who are confused about what's the right way, what's the wrong way. Should I do this? Should I not do this? There are people who have heartaches. There are people bearing guilt and shame and burdens that nobody knows about. And Lord, you do. And I'm asking, Lord, I know you gave these truths to me as soon as I was asked to preach, just prayed about what to preach, you gave me these points, and I just pray that you would help me to get across some of these things that you've put on my heart for your, your people, Lord. Lord, we're concerned. We love these young people. We have a burden for them. We know that you're for them and the devil's against them. And, and sometimes... We all get this way. We think that those in authority over us are against us because they're trying to help us and point us in the right direction. We've got this stubborn will that wants to go the other way. And Lord, I pray you'd help me as I try to encourage your people tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, we live in a world of limitations. You know that men can't fly you know, people try, right? They put on wings, they strap on wings, they climb up on top of a roof and jump off. Isn't that so stupid? I mean, if you're, it's a lot safer to try when you're on the ground. I mean, if it's going to work, don't you think you'd be able to elevate? No, but no, no, no. And how about for the, for the, um, the, the science geeks here? Uh, here's, a, here's a fact about a limitation in the world. Uh, there, nothing can be colder than minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. 
random fact, some of you probably knew that. It's called absolute zero. I didn't know that, but that's one of those things. Um, here's another limitation. The Chicago Bears can't win the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Nor will the Cubs win the World Series within the next 100 years. I mean, they did once within the last 100 years. So um, here's another one. I don't need this here in a moment. Uh, seventh grade boys can't figure out what to do with a bar of soap and deodorant. <laughs> do, you know, do we have any teachers in here? You, you teach junior hires. Any teachers in here? Um, have, or, are you upperclassmen? You ever walked into a classroom that was just occupied by seventh and eighth graders? Isn't there just like an aroma that's not normally there? Um, you know, there are even some seventh graders that are so proud of not taking a shower that they just, yeah. In fact, there might even be one here. Is there any seventh grader who has not taken a shower this week? Would you raise your hand? That you're bold enough. In the last two days, you haven't taken a shower. Anybody? There's people pointing. He... <laughs> All right, anybody who smells like they haven't taken a shower. Into, okay, come on up here. Come on, come on. I've got something for you. There you go. It's, it, that'll help. He was wanting to raise his hand. He just couldn't because he slipped and actually took a shower sometime this week. No, but we... We live in a world of limitations, don't we? We have speed limits. We don't want to talk about those too much, right? Uh, weight limits, we really don't want to talk about those. We have financial limits, right? There's that car that you want, and then there's that one that you can afford. The one that you can afford usually has duct tape keep, <laughs> keeping it together. There are height limits. Have you ever seen a, a truck tr drive through an overpass? and get wedged in there. It's like, you know, you probably should have read the sign there. Um, but just as there are natural limitations, there are also spiritual ones. We all are limited due to a weak, sinful flesh. You know, the longer you're saved, your flesh doesn't get better. It's still weak. It's still sinful. As long as I've been saved, as long as I've been reading my Bible and praying, my flesh is no better than it ever was. And it never will be. And the Bible says in Galatians 5.17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Get that? They're against each other. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. There are some young people in here that want to do what's right. And you can't. And then you've got the principal, you've got the teachers, you've got the pastor, you've got the youth pastor, you've got your parents who are all telling you, this is what you need to do, and you keep blowing it. And they look at you and say, can't you figure this out? And you're like, no! No! And you think everyone's against you. We're really not against you. We're trying to get you to see what's right. And you're like, I know what's right. I just can't do it. And sometimes we fail as leaders to be able to step in and say, yeah, I can see you're trying. Um, let me help you. Paul said in Romans 7, 19, for the good that I would... I do not. That's some things I really want to do. I, I don't do them. He said, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Am I relating to anybody here? I, I want to do what's right, and I don't. I don't want to do that bad thing, and then I do. And then people get on me. And, and rightly so. Some, we need to get, be gotten on, right? We need hot preaching sometimes. Some, you do wrong. There is a time of reaping. All of that. 
but we are very limited. But thankfully, God's unlimited. And in, in Matthew 19, 26, it says, with men, this is impossible. It's impossible for us to do a lot of things. But with God, you know it, all things are possible. Amen. So you just said, I can't. No, you can't. But with God, you can. Luke 1, 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. So God can do all things. And life will make a lot more sense to you when you begin to see two things. First one is that you are limited. And secondly, that God is not. Amen. And our text makes it clear. There in verse 7, uh, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God has designed it this way. We are earthen vessels. Earthen vessels are weak. Those earthen vessels, those clay pots, they're fragile. And we have this treasure of God's power within us. Why? Because if anything good happens, it's because of God, not because of me and not because of you. And then God gets the glory. This is how God has designed it. And, and if you think that you're limitless, you are sadly mistaken. You get out on the basketball court, I am going to smoke you. I mean, how much trash talk goes on? I mean, I am going to smoke. I'm going to light you up. You know, and then you trip. Very few people can actually back up their trash talk, by the way. Can I say this? We can't do life. You can't. But with God, you can. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Our strength needs to come from Christ. So I want to consider some areas where God is limitless, and then see how he can help us with our limitations. So number one, he's, he has a limitless plan. <laughs> Every sermon so far has talked about God has a plan for your life. And I'm like, you know what, I had that written down, you know, a long time ago. You know why? Because God has a plan for your life. And maybe God wants you to know that. 1 Corinthians, let me just read to you, uh, 2, 9 says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You can't even imagine the plan that God has for your life. Now, when I was young, I was, I was talking to Brother Ramos, you know, I taught Pastor Mitchell. Pastor Burke. I know he looks older than me. <laughs> but if I grew my beard out, I'd look old too. Um, I taught him. And Mr. Ramos is preaching tomorrow. I taught him. I'm like, I am old. Good thing I don't look old or act old or anything like that, right? I have no idea why I said that. I was going somewhere. That's what, another thing that happens when you get old. You just don't remember. <laughs> but God has a wonderful plan for your life. See, it came back. Wow. Praise the Lord. I was young. And I remember being young. I really do. I, rem I had plans. I was like, you know what? I, I, was, I, I had an aptitude for math and science. I didn't like it, but I had an aptitude for it. And what I did like, I liked money. So I figured, I will just go and be an electrical engineer so I can make big money. I want to have a fast car with, you know, the stereo system that would just boom, 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 you know, and just reverberate and, um, and have a nice house and just a cush life. That was my goal in life. What a, what a, a high bar I had. And then after uh, <laughs> two terms of college, I'm like, this is boring. So some of my buddies and I said, let's just drop out of school and 
go out to Colorado and be ski bums. So we did that. What? That is another really high goal I had in life. I had other, other things. I won't bore you with all the things I thought I could do. I had, I had my plans. Let me ask you this. Do you think David, King David, ever imagined while he was tending sheep that he was going to be the king? How about Joseph? I think it never even came into his mind that he was going to be the second in command while he was in the pit. Or while he was in prison. How about Moses' mother? Do you think she could have even dreamed? I mean, when she took her son and cast him into the Nile River, do you think it even entered into her mind that he could possibly be the leader and deliverer of Israel? God had plan for, plans for those men, and he has plans for you. I want you to turn to um, 2 Kings chapter number 5. We're going to get there in just a moment. And you say, Pastor Olson, that's fine, but there was only one David, there was only one Joseph, and there was only one Moses, and I'm not him or, or either of those guys. So, yeah, that's true. That's true. Can I say this? Not everyone is going to have a famous name. But God still has a plan for your life. There are some people in the Bible that did some very important things, and we don't even know who, who they were. We don't even know their names. I want to look at one of them here just briefly for a moment. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now Naaman, we know him, captain, he's the guy that had the attitude and repented, and God worked a miracle, and he was healed. He was captain of the, the host of the king of Assyria. He was a big, big shot. He was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid... And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. It's a little maid. Taken captive during war. She's a slave making the best of her situation, serving God where she was, and says, wants to give God the glory, and says, if he was with the prophet, things would be different. We don't know her name, but there's a, a miracle in the Bible that's recorded because she did what she could, where she could, while she could. That's a pretty big, pretty big uh, thing she did. We don't even know who she was. God wants to use everybody in a special way to touch someone else's life. And if you touch one life, you have done something. You may, your name might not ever be recorded in a book. It might not be shouted from the pulpit. You might not get the pat on the back that you think you deserve or whatever. But if you do, if God uses you in one way to touch one life that is worth it and I'll tell you this God wants to use you to touch more than one life don't miss out on God's plan boy I almost missed out on God's plan I was so busy having, having the time of my life I thought I was actually really miserable because sin doesn't make you happy I didn't know God wanted me in Bible college. I didn't know he wanted me to be a preacher. I didn't know he wanted me to be a missionary. I am so happy I did not miss out. I look back at all my high school friends. I went to public school. I went and look at, uh, they're heathen. <laughs> and I was living like a heathen. 
Some of them are dead. Some have been in jail. One of them's a vegetable because he, he was driving drunk one night and smashed into someone, killed the person, and he ended up in, 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 as, a, as a vegetable. I am so blessed. I've traveled to many parts of the world. I've seen God do absolute miracles on the mission field. I've gotten to lead people to Christ who are dead now and in heaven. You, 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 can't, you can't get any thrill better than that. Knowing, had I not gone and witnessed to that person, they'd be burning in hell right now. And I almost missed all those blessings and so many more. I mean, blessings. I mean, on the mission field, right? My son John's back there. We got charged by an elephant. Wasn't that exciting? He's in the back of the pickup yelling, Dad, go! I'm trying to get a video. <laughs> go! <laughs> it's like, I went, you know. Face to face with a spinning cobra. <laughs> Wasn't face to face long because as soon as he raised up, I'm like, ah, <laughs> I turned and dove. <laughs> oh, the exciting times. God has a limitless plan. You do, you can't even imagine what God has planned for you. You say, but I know what I want to do. What you want to do is absolutely nothing in comparison to what God wants to do. And I'll tell you, when I have followed my will, I've never been as happy as when I followed God's will. So just find God's will and do what he wants. And sometimes you just find God's will by doing what you know he wants you to do. And then you find yourself in God's will. It's a limitless plan. Secondly, God has limitless power. Limitless power. In um, Ephesians 3.20, let me read it to you. Familiar verse. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So we need his power working in us, not our power. And if you're saved, you have that power there. It's lying dormant in some because of a backslidden condition. As strong as you think you are, you're still weak. I don't know how many people in, in ministry I've had to counsel people over the years, and I don't know how many times I've said, you, you need to be careful of this, this, and this. Oh, no, pastor, I know I would never do that. I am strong enough. And like clockwork, They prove they're not strong enough. Can I just say this, young people? When your pastor, when your parents say, hey, this is the direction you're going and this is what it's going to end up like if you don't change, they do know what they're talking about. They do. Some of you 15, 16, 17, 18. I've been that many times. As we said before, all flesh is weak. It never gets stronger. You know, young men, bless your heart, right? As long as you can rip on people as long as you say, bless your heart, right? <laughs> young men, bless your heart. You like to lift weights and build muscles, and, and that's okay. And some of you will lift weights and build muscles and stand in front of the mirror and take selfies and post them. That's not okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's really not okay. Um, I don't care how big your muscles are. You say, Pastor Olson, I could take you. Take me where? <laughs> um... You know, as big as your muscles are, you're still weak. Because 
A sign of a man's strength is not how much he can bench. Samson was the strongest man to ever live. But he was defeated by another giant, right? No. Who was he defeated by? A woman. Now, if you ever have, if you ever, <laughs> guys, if you ever have to do counseling sometime and guy says, hey, my wife just beat me up. Well, you've got some counseling to do right there. Um, but people like to play with sin and say, I, I can handle it. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 26, for she, this is talking about the strange woman, the whorish woman, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. These big tough guys, <laughs> oh yeah, man. <laughs> And then this girl comes up, puts her arm, or wraps her little arm around his big muscle, and he melts. She says, why don't you come over here? No, we shouldn't. Well, maybe we should do that. <laughs> and he's just a fish. <laughs> yeah, but I'm strong. No, you're weak. But thankfully, God is all-powerful. Would you turn with me to 1 John chapter number 2? 1 John chapter 2, I'm glad that God has power. I'm glad he's willing to share that power with me. You know, the world is filled with temptations. There are temptations out there. There are things that will make us want to look at them, and there are things that we want to listen to that we shouldn't listen to, things we want to see that we shouldn't see, places we shouldn't go that we want to go to. And we need some supernatural strength to get us through this, this tough life. And so in 1 John chapter number 2, look in verse number 13. He says, I write unto you fathers, not you old dudes, right? Because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Straight, straight, got right there, man. See, I'm a young man. I just whooped the devil. Continue. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because, here we are, ye are strong. You're like, yep, right there. The Bible says it. I'm young. I am strong. Stop preaching about me and my muscles. It has nothing to do with muscles. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and here's why they were strong. The word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. The only way you and I will have power to overcome the wicked one and the temptations of this world is when the word of God is in us. Are you in the word of God? Do you saturate your mind and your heart with the Bible? If you want God's unlimited power, you need to have the Bible in you. What sin has controlled your life? Is it pornography? I've read the statistics. It's unbelievably shocking. And people just accept it. Like, yes, yeah, so, yep, yeah, so what's the big deal? It is a big deal. Because if you just continue to look at women like a piece of meat you will not be able to look at a woman in the right way for the rest of your life if you just condition yourself that way. You know, women aren't something that you get something out of. What sin has hooked you? Is it pornography? Is it fornication, sneaking around with a guy or girl? You're not, you're not married, but yeah. crowd this size, not going to be shocked. Some have experimented with some drinking, vaping, smoking. Okay. 
I'm sure nobody in here listens to worldly music because it's not even a temptation to the flesh, right? Of course it is. It's a huge problem. Now they call it, it's not CCM, it still is CCM. Now they call it worship music. Oh, if I call it worship, then I must be worshiping God. No, you're worshiping man because it's all flesh. Ungodly videos, bad language, gossip, bitter, what who knows? You can't overcome any sin in your strength. Some of you said, I've tried. You're right, you've tried, but you fail. Why do you fail? Because you have no strength. And when you get into God's word, you will have strength. I have counseled, I have dealt with people hooked on pornography. Grown men, married men. Their lives are in shambles. Their marriages are falling apart. People being uh, uh, suicidal. <laughs> it's like, like you said this morning, one question I, I usually ask is, um, have you been having your devotions? No. You know where my counseling starts? Okay. Let's start having a daily time in God's word. And I give them something to be accountable. And we meet back again. And you know what? People start having victory. Hello. <laughs> you hear it preached. You hear it taught. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. It needs to be in it, in your heart. And you need to be in it every day. And we don't do it. You can't overcome. My, I told you, my flesh is, is, is as weak as it was when I got saved. And my flesh still likes to sin. I have a little history with sin because I'm a sinner. <laughs> and I was in the world. And I preach strong and hard against the world. You know why I preach strong and hard against the world? Because I hate it because I know what it did to me and I don't want it to do the same thing to other people. And people look at me like, you're just so mean. Okay, I mean, we can find you an Aaron, I guess. But God wants to set you free. In John chapter 8, 30, verse 36, if the Son therefore make you free, ye shall be, get that, free indeed. Is there a sin? Let me rephrase that. What sin is held on to you? You've wanted to shake it. And you haven't been able to. Which one? Did, did you come to Jesus for salvation? You can come to him again and say, Lord Jesus, you said if I come to you, it, it, you would make me free. I'd be free indeed. I need to be free from this. I can't do it. You see, this, this is our limitation, but God is limitless. I can't do it. This is the secret to the Christian life. I can't, but you can. I like this in, in Romans Chapter 6, verse 18, being then made free from sin, ooh, ye became the servants of righteousness. Free from sin? I, I mean, it doesn't have to be like lording over me. I can have victory, yes. We can get into God's word. We can let it cleanse us. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, Jesus said in John chapter 15. You read God's word, it's like taking a bath. It just cleanses your mind and your heart. You, you can attack that sin, get some verses that, you're, that deal with the sin that you're, you're struggling with and memorize them. And not just memorize them, but try to put them in, into practice. And God will give you victory. Don't believe the devil's lie that you can't have victory over sin because you can. I like preaching messages like this. You know why? Because... God loves you, and he's got a great plan for you. He's got 
He's got unlimited power. Thirdly, limitless peace. Limitless peace. Let me ask you a question. Do you worry about things? I do. Let me ask you another question. Do you fear the unknown? <laughs> I'm tough, man. I don't fear. Let me tell you what I fear. So <laughs> you're not really strong. You know, I'll put myself in the same company with David. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in the. You know, David was afraid. That's why he killed Goliath. He was afraid. Nehemiah was afraid. Read about Nehemiah. Paul was afraid. Without were fightings, within were what? Fears. Let's just be honest. We are afraid. Let me ask you this. Is there anyone here that you've been really going at it with something in your life? And you're like, I'm going to give God one more chance. And if he doesn't help me with this, I'm done. There's no hope. There's no hope. Perhaps someone here has been abused. Maybe verbally. Maybe physically. Maybe morally. And it's messed up your mind. And you're afraid. And you have no hope. And you can't tell anybody. Let me tell you, you can. You feel dirty. You feel violated. You feel guilty. You feel worthless. And you're hopeless. God offers hope. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Is that a promise here for someone tonight? Why? That you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, it may be that, maybe we're not talking about abuse, maybe, maybe someone here has experienced a very tragic loss or an unbearable heartache, a family trial, something that's just, you don't even want to talk about it. Can I tell you, life's difficult. And you cannot always control what happens to you. There are some things in life that just aren't fair. You can ask God later why he let them happen to you. It's not fair. I've said that to God. It's, God, it's just not fair. I did this and this and this and this and you let this happen. It's just not fair. Yeah. Life's difficult. Over 11 people take their lives every minute. Let that sink in. Over 11 people end their lives every minute. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for teenagers and young adults. Second leading cause of death. What on earth? More than 20% of teens have seriously considered suicide. You know what that tells me? That there's a good number of young people in here who've wanted to end their life.
sitting right here. It may have been in the past. It may be presently. Thoughts like this come into minds. I just can't take it any longer. It hurts too much to to continue living the way I'm living. I just can't deal with it. How about this one? I've made a mess out of my life, and there's no way to fix it. There's no way. I can't come clean with mom and dad. They'll kill me. And then one that just seems so right, but it's so wrong. Everyone would be better off if I was just dead. Uh, No, they wouldn't be. They'd be heartbroken. So no, it would break my parents' hearts if they knew what I've done. No, you do not know what you do to your parents. As long as you're alive, there's still hope. And God offers peace. Jesus is not just part of the Christmas season. He is the Prince of Peace. Prince, a prince, you know what a prince has? He has power. He has authority. Jesus has the authority to give me peace. I don't deserve it sometimes, but I'm so happy I get it. And why don't we have it? It's usually because of some sin that we let into our lives. Let me read a verse to you. Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, saith my God, unto who? The wicked. So let's break this down. Let's make an application. If you and I are holding on to a sin, covering a sin, we'll never have peace. Hold on with me. This is, this is, this is really important. God gave you spiritual authorities. If you don't like that word, sorry, authority. He's given you people who love you, who are charged to help you and to care for you and to get you through some struggles in life. They've been through those things. You've got pastors and youth pastors. You've got your parents who love you. They pray for you. They have so much invested. And then you get into sin and you won't even get help from them. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. What are you covering? What are you hiding from mom and dad? No, but if they knew, they need to know. No, 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 they, they, they need to know. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Say, well, I confess to God. Amen. But you need help to forsake them. You can't do it on your own. You've got a support group. People who love you, they're praying for you. They want to help you do it, but you can't do it by yourself. I've seen too many young people say, oh, no, I'm going to handle this. They don't handle it. They go to their friends, and the friends give them horrible advice. My parents have killed me. No, they may be disappointed. But every good parent is happy to help their children. They love you. And too many people, young people, never get help from the ones that God's given to them. I I have seen it in too many families. Kid sneaks around. Kid gets in sin. Kid covers up sin. Won't get help. 
builds walls against their parents. Parents see there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. I'm praying. I'm talking to them. I'm doing the best I can. I'm working with them. And the walls are built. I can't get through to my child. The children built those walls. And the sin comes out in the open. Yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. But the walls are still up. You've hidden that sin for four, five, six years. You've been living, let me tell you, you've been living independently from your mom and dad for five or six years years without the godly help and counsel and you will probably take the rest of your life and go on without their help and counsel and you will have a strained family relationship and it is your fault I love you enough to tell you that God has limitless peace there's no peace saith my God you don't have peace some of you are disturbed and troubled inside right now because you know there's something you you just haven't come clean come clean tonight stop covering that sin some of you tonight need to have that difficult conversation with your parents If they're here, you need to see them tonight. You know it. I can't. You need to. Because he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Then we have limitless pardon. Aren't you happy about that? Whew. God wants to do great things for us and with us and through us. His goodness and his power are unlimited. Well, someone might say, well, why doesn't he do those things for me? I see him doing those things for other people. And that's a great question. Why doesn't he do those things for me? Well, probably a couple reasons are, I see as possibilities why we limit God. Because he's unlimited. First is unbelief, right? What did Jesus say um, about Jesus? And he, Jesus, did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Well, unbelief is just a little sin. God calls it an evil heart of unbelief. And he blesses faith. And if we stop looking at our limitations and start looking at the limitless God, oh my, what a life we could have. The second reason we miss out on God's blessings is sin. Okay, uh, Jeremiah 5.25. Your iniquities have turned away these things. And your sins have withholden, get this, good things from you. God wants to do good things for you and give you good things and bless you with good things. You know, God wants to give you a good husband and a good, or a good wife, a good job, a bright future. Wow. He's got so much good waiting for you. But our sin withholds that. I'll go back. What sin are you holding on to? You're not only missing God's peace, but you're missing God's best. And the devil is a liar. He'll convince you, some of you, that you've gone too far and God won't forgive you. You confess that. No, he'll tell me, you, you confessed that last week and the week before and the week before. God, God's tired of you. You can't get forgiveness. Oh, show me that in the Bible. Huh? I was preaching in Zambia a couple Sundays ago, and I, it was exciting to be back there. And I was preaching out of Ephesians chapter 2. And listen to this verse with, with me. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And I just paused and said, God is rich in mercy. Let me ask you, what does it mean to be rich? In my mind, what it means to be rich is that you have an abundance of something, right? So rich people seem to never run out of money, right? 
You ever see some people, it's like, they go on a nice vacation. You know, like six months later, they're going on this another, like, lifetime vacation. Like, yeah, I haven't even done that once yet, you know? <laughs> uh, and amen. Praise the Lord. God blesses people. But you know what I'm saying? Bless their heart. No, uh, <laughs> God, the Bible says, is rich in mercy. Do you know what that means? His mercy, he never runs out. If I mess up, and I do, I can go and ask God, oh God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what he does? He forgives me. Amen. And I may blow it again. I'll say, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to have this attitude. I'm never going to do any of that again. And then I blow it. Why? Because I am weak flesh. Oh, hold on. Time out for a second. Young people, your parents love you, and they have weak flesh too, and they make mistakes, and they sin. Oh, believe it or not. And they still have the authority to tell you not to do what's wrong. Cut them some slack and forgive them. Okay, time back in. God is rich in mercy. When I need to be forgiven, he never runs out. There's not a sin that you have committed that God cannot forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from just a few of those unrighteousnesses. No, 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 from all unrighteousness. Even the really bad ones. And you know what? Every sin is really bad in God's eyes. It's all hideous. And if you come back to God in repentance, he'll forgive you every time. No, you don't deserve it. And humanly speaking, we should never be forgiven, but he does it anyway because he loves us. He's unlimited in his willingness and his ability to forgive. So there's not anyone in here who has gone so far that you can't be forgiven and that you can't be restored, because you can. Because God is unlimited. I've seen people get into some horrible sin. And when they get right with God, I just get so mad at them. It's like, what are you doing, jerk? I can't be mad at you anymore. Is that my attitude? No, I am like, praise the Lord. This is good stuff. And I'm happy. I can rejoice with them. The prodigal son, he returned home, and his father was waiting for him with open arms. And God is ready to welcome you also. Let me wrap it up and give you the last one. There are limitless possibilities. Now, with ourselves, we're limited. But with God, there's limitless possibilities. Now, again, we all have limitations. Too often we look at others who have more talent and say, I can't do what they do. You know, some people have educational liabilities. (laughs) Some people have physical limitations. And I'll just tell you this. I'll be honest with you. I have had to deal with both over the years. Can I say this? I did not grow up with a good education. I didn't go to Christian school. I went to public school. And one of the main things you're going to need to know how to do if you're going to learn anything in life is to read and I, being the product of the public school system, and they were, you know, they've always had these great ideas of how to teach people different things. Phonics, I'm like, when I came to college here, I'm seeing these little kids do phonics things. I'm like, what's phonics? You know, I still probably can't even do them. M, 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 yeah, ma, me, ma, ma, all those things. Um, see, told you. Uh, and I was taught the look-say method. So what's that? You look at the word, then you say it. Well, that's great, but what if you don't know what to say? I remember them teaching us this. If you don't know what that word is, just guess and go on. 
That's how I was taught to read. So, by the time I got into eighth grade, I remember reading one book. One book. So, how did you get to eighth grade with reading one book? I was dumb. Actually, I wasn't dumb, but I felt dumb. And so, um, you said, how'd you get through high school? Well, that was easy. You have a book report, flip the book over, there's a little blurb on the back. You rewrite that, put it in your own words, that's your book report, that's a summary. <laughs> you said you went to, uh, you know, electric control engineering. I did, and we had to take English. And they made us read, okay, there's a little thing called cliff notes. So I got the cliff notes, which is a, like, a really shortened version of what's going on in the book, but I couldn't even take the time to read through those, so I just kind of skimmed through those. So then I came to Bible college. Oh. Let me back up. I got right with God at some point, and I started reading the Bible, and like, I have no idea what this says. Thee thou believest what? <laughs> I couldn't even read modern English. And I'm like reading the Bible, I'm like, Lord, I have no idea what I'm reading. But I just remember saying, Lord, can you give me one thing? Can you help me understand one verse when I try to read this chapter? Because I, I, I'm not getting anything. I could, I'm the type of guy I could read through something and say, I have no idea what I just read. Reading comprehension, zero. I am not exaggerating. <laughs> so I come to college, and we have this, there was this great, I'm saying this for your sake, Pastor Burke, this great course called History of Civilization. <laughs> I mean, there's this joker book about this big. <laughs> and there's a quiz. Here's, here's your reading assignment, and there's a quiz. And there's five questions on the quiz. Each one's 20 points. The last question was always, did you read the assignment? No! I can't read! <laughs> the best I ever got on a quiz was 80%, and it went down from there. Somehow I got out of that class. I have no idea, but I got out of that class. So, I did get better at reading, but I still wasn't good. Then I went off to master's school. I had my bachelor's in, <laughs> in pastoral theology, and, and then uh, a pastor said, well, I want you to be the, Christ the principal of the Christian school, so I want you to get uh, a master's in educational administration. Education. Principal. <laughs> uh, so we go. And the, my friends are there too. And they're taking another track of things. They're, they're out playing basketball at night. Go to class in the day, playing basketball at night. And I'm in the room like reading and reading and reading and reading. I had one course. I had to read five. I had like two weeks. Five books and a book report for each one. And then a 10-page philosophy paper on top of that. I'm like, I am going to die. <laughs> There's one book we had to read. It's called The Long War Against God. And it was big. My friends were like, hey, what are you reading tonight? The Long War Against Dave? Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> now, I'm not stupid. I don't, but I, I felt stupid because I was academically challenged. But you know what? God has a sense of humor. The guy who I just described who struggles to read, and this is not me. I'm just saying this. I'm just saying with God there's limitless possibilities. 
He's allowed me to write over, he's allowed me to write 20 tracks and I've written over a dozen books. How on earth does, and people actually said that they've got a blessing out of them. <laughs> How on earth does that happen? Because God can take our weaknesses and work through us despite ourselves. Get a hold of this. I mean, physical limitations. We had a bad car accident in Africa. Some of you know this. You've heard this story. You're like, yeah, you just keep talking about this. Yeah, because that's what God has done. My wife broke her neck. I had a bad head injury. That was my fifth concussion. Traumatic brain injury, TBI. Sometimes my brain doesn't work right. You say, I knew that. <laughs> it's true. But he still uses me. I don't care what your physical limitations are, your education limitations are. With God, all things are possible. I know I'm not anybody. I, I really do know that. And if someone says, I get a blessing out of that, I'm like, that wasn't me. Sometimes I can read something I've written and not even remember writing it. <laughs> I turned something into proofing one time. This is great. Uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I get it back from the proofer and said, um, you know, you used the same story in this chapter as you did like three chapters before. It was such a good story. In my mind, I needed to, to tell it. And I had forgotten because of my train damage that, you get that, that I didn't even remember including it in a previous chapter. It's like, how on earth I get away with stuff sometimes? I don't even know. And God still uses me. I'm like, praise the Lord. Physical limitations. My dad's 88 years old. He can't walk real well. He gets real wobbly. He's falling down. He's a big guy. He gets hurt. He can't go door to door soul winning, but he loves to be a soul. He loves to witness. He loves people. He gets on his little motorized scooter and goes down to the town green on Saturdays looking for people to talk to, passing out gospel tracts, leading people to the Lord because he's just going to do something for the Lord and we don't have to be limited by our circumstances. We can turn to an almighty God who can help us overcome and what we can't overcome, he can use those limitations in these earthen vessels of ours so that he gets the glory. Man, everyone's got things they're self-conscious about. How do you look? My nose is too big. My ears are too big. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. We've all complained about our lot in life some point, but Paul warned us not to do that. He says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou that made me thus? How come you didn't give me a good outgoing personality like so-and-so? Because I would serve you then. Because God wants to, you to serve him with your dull, boring personality. And then when something good happens, he gets the glory. And just try not to be so dull. <laughs> that helps too. Rather than complain about our limitations... Can I urge you to do this? Embrace them. And thank God for your weaknesses and trust God to use you despite your limitations. What is it that God wants you to do? On your own, you can't do it. But through him, you can do anything. So I can't help in a Sunday school class. I don't have patience to work with little kids. Yes, you can. I can't take a stand for righteousness in school. Yes, you can. I'm not strong enough, but God is. I can't give up my worldly music. Yes, you can. I did. I can't become a school teacher. I know what students are like. I am one. <laughs> I could never be a pastor. 
God can't use me like he uses other people. Why don't you just leave that up to God? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. With God, all things are possible. We have unlimited possibilities despite our limitations. You know, Jacob, Jacob had limitations. He had all sorts of problems. And you know what his response was? He said, all these things are against me. He looked at all his trouble. David had limitations too. You know what he, how he responded? God is for me. One says, all these things are against me. Another one says, God is for me. Who was more successful? The one who stopped looking at his limitations and started looking at God. And we can do the same thing. How are you going to respond? I had more exciting things to share, but I guess just going to wrap it up. When we arrived in Zambia on our trip, I received a notification on my phone that said, unlimited data and texts. It's like, wow, one good thing about having T-Mobile. Unlimited data and texts. Yes. And when I was in the capital, it was great. And then when I get out in the bush... It was not, because I was outside the coverage area. I wasn't connected. It was supposed to be unlimited, but it was very limited. And too often, we're a lot like our phone, my phone. We're supposed to have unlimited help from God, but we're outside of God's coverage area. We're living in sin and unbelief, and we forfeit all that God wanted to do for us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.